another study was done by a PhD student of mine. He, she looked at uh, 20 native English speakers who had uh, been raised monolingually, hadn't started learning English, uh, French before the age of 11, and whose average age of significant, significant exposure to French was 28.6 years. Okay. They were all resident in French and all, all could pass for native speakers of French on occasion. Three of these subjects, okay, uh, she, she subjected these uh, learners to a, a range of tests. Three of the subjects came out as native, like in all respects. Okay, and again, the effective dimension comes out here. All the, all the successful subjects conducted their social life primarily through French. All identified themselves closely with the Francophone community, and all thought it was important to uh, pass for native speaker French. And all them, all of them had French partners. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip uh, quickly. Now, um, <clears throat> in order not to keep you from your coffee, right? <laughs> uh, so there are, there are more examples. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that if we are genuinely to make progress in understanding diversity of, attain of attainments evidenced in L2 acquisition, we need to get beyond our obsession with the notion of the critical period and to take a wider ranging, fine grained, qualitative look at the entire context of high attaining and low attaining learners. Of course, maturation has to come into the picture somehow, okay? Maturation is a factor, but not necessarily in the way uh, it's viewed in CPH rhetoric. But a range of other, also, uh, we we've already seen today that also a range of other factors come into the picture, including, for example, conditions of learning, quantity and quality of input, and the effective dimension. So while I'm not denying uh, the, the reality of age-related factor, uh, age fact, the age factor, the maturational factor as such, and uh, uh, other age-related factors in L2 learning, I'd like to suggest that we need to loosen uh, the association between uh, our view of ultimate, ultimate attainment uh, and the critical period hypothesis. Uh, we need a richer harvest, okay, uh, a richer perspective and a richer harvest of, of findings in this matter. We, it, it isn't just age, that's what I'm, just, I'm saying. Uh, that age may come into it, that age comes into everything. Speaking as a 64-year-old, I can tell you that most things get worse as you get older. <laughs> Some of you may feel uh, uh, I'm exaggerating, but uh, um, I can say that. <laughs> uh, the voice of experience. But the point is, now this is a different matter from, uh, you know, that doesn't mean to say there aren't compensations that will come out of that, and, and uh, it doesn't mean you have to give up on everything, including language learning, okay, including language learning. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, if, if I met, um, if I met a, a Catalan lady uh, tomorrow, who knows, I might be a fluent Catalan speaker by, by Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> So other things, no, I mean, you know this from your experience of life, and that uh, 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 the, these other factors exist, length of exposure, conditions of exposure, your attitudes, um, your emotional involvement, you know, these, 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 these play a role which, which counterbalance, or may counterbalance the, the age factor. Maturation, you know, if you think about maturation, Learning gets harder as we get older, in all in all spheres, you know. And um, but that doesn't mean to say there's a doesn't mean to say we're subject to the guillotine factor. It doesn't mean to say there's an age beyond which we cannot do it anymore. No, even 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 the, into their seventies uh, and eighties, uh, uh, people can can um, can do all kinds of uh, things if they have the motivation. And uh, so. Um, that's what I have to say, really. And this, here's a here's a here's a here's, here's a, um, a proof that age is not all bad. This is my first grandson. So thank thank you much for your thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, David, for your very inspiring talk. I think you've 
given us hope to those of us who are in the business of teaching languages uh, to adults. So in this time of crisis and cutbacks, uh, we can still teach uh, grown-ups and, <laughs> and there's hope for us. Um, are there any questions? I'll, I'll stay Hello. Um, first of all, thank you very much. I enjoyed the talk. The critical period hypothesis seems to be taken as a given by most students. Um, and I was just wondering if there was the opposite, where there was a critical period when people didn't learn. <laughs> I teach, uh, I have groups <coughs> of students who are 50 to 80 years old, and they take it as a given that they're not going to learn as children. And they believe that you know, the only way to learn a language is as a child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I tell them that that's not true. No, it isn't true. I mean, it, it, I mean again, people don't, should look at the research. You know, there, there is, there are, there is, in, especially in recent years, there have been studies of older, you know, people who studied, uh, who started learning uh, the second language in, the, in their late teens, for example, or the 20s. And... Um, uh, Theo Bongartz in the Netherlands did some studies of these people and in, he discovered that um, in all, all the groups she, he looked at, uh, there were always people who could actually reach native-like levels, okay? And um, no, I mean, and if you look at the, uh, the, the work done in adult education, you know, they, you know, it isn't the case that when you reach 50 or 60, you, you can't do it anymore. I mean, there are some areas where older people find it more difficult. I don't talk about myself here now. Um, uh, we, people are maybe a bit slower, but not necessarily. Uh, they have, um, you know, a, a decline in the acuity of their senses, hearing and sight and so on. That make th that maybe make things uh, the task more difficult. But on the whole, you know, uh, older learners do very well. In, uh, they may have some problems with phonology too because of the uh, hearing loss and so on. But by and large, older learners uh, uh, have been found to be capable of uh, most things that younger learners are capable of. This is this is the third age learning I'm talking about. So it certainly isn't the case that older uh, teenagers, okay, can, can't do it. They can. Uh, the study I was talking about there, um, uh, Kara Kinsler, um, she, uh, most of the, most, uh, she had 20, uh, she had 20 learners um, who uh, had, had, no, had had no significant exposure to French before the, their 20s, okay? And all of them could, uh, at this stage could, could pass the native speakers, and three of them actually outperformed native speakers in relation to a, a accent, a regional accent recognition, you know? So, I mean, we need to make, I think what we need to, what those of us working in this area need to do is to, to make the findings better known, okay? I mean, I, the, clearly people don't realize that starting a language young in school is not going to help particularly in terms of the, uh, advancing, advantaging people in terms of efficiency. That needs to be more widely known. But also the, the findings about older learners, you know, people at 20s and 30s um, passing native speakers, you know, that needs to be better known than it is. I always say that, as in all other areas, age is not an excuse. <laughs> well, it's, just a, it's just a comment. It's the, these learners who are, let's say, senior learners, the effective factors are very high. They're very, very motivated. Much more motivated than maybe a child yeah, in primary school yeah, yeah, who is not true. motivated that, at all. That's true, but... Just like that, in a position well, where these people actually... You know, pay money to study, and it's something. Yeah, that uh, uh, that's true, but well, that's true. But if you think, uh, compare if you let's compare like with like. Okay, we compare uh, a child learning, say, English here in, in Barcelona. Okay, with a, with a um, at age five. Okay, well let's let's take another language. Okay, because English is a bit perhaps a special case. But uh, somebody learning French. Yeah. Um, at age five versus learning French at age. 15, okay. Um, the five, it's very hard to, 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 to um, convince 
the five-year-old that you know French is going to uh, has any importance at all in his or li her life. You know, we have this problem, you know, in Eng in English-speaking countries generally that, that people can't imagine that they are going to speak the, the language in question, you know, because English so, is so dominant. But you, c you might be able to convince a 15-year-old, okay, th but it's very hard to motivate uh, to motivate a five-year-old uh, if the, the child has got no contact or experience with of and with the uh, the language in question. So, I don't know, I think there are, there are, it cuts both ways, but certainly, if you can motivate, if you can motivate a 15-year-old, the 15-year-old is likely to be able to get quite a distance in the language. Okay, and it says, does an attachment to identity culture has much influence on maturation? No, this is, yeah. Uh, <coughs> yes, it does. I mean, it is related to maturation in this sense, that if you, if you arrive, in, if you arrive uh, uh, as I was saying, in, as an immigrant in, ch in a country at age 15, you're likely to already have your identity, your, to, to a culture, your affiliation to a culture more or less fixed, okay? So, the, uh, whereas if you arrive as a five-year-old, you know, there isn't that fixity of, of identity. So that, 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 that's, 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 what, that's part of the, 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 um, the, uh, the question. If you're talking about, uh, talking more, ge more generally, um, um, well, this is, a, is, this is a question for Catalonia now, actually. The, 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 to the extent to which uh, Catalans are affiliated to, associated with the, this, this region of Spain, okay, it clearly will have an influence on their motivation to learn Catalan. I mean, I, I mean maybe it's gone beyond that point in Catalonia. But um, uh, if, you, if you feel a, a strong affiliation to, uh, ident identification with, a particular cultural language, this will it, it clearly influence uh, your progress in relation to the language and your um, desire to um, uh, involve yourself with the culture. I mean, that, that's everyone's experience, isn't it? I mean, it, it goes back to you know, the, the old uh, Lambert and Wallace uh, the stuff about um, I uh, integrative motivation. I mean that, that which is which is demonstrated uh, and is, is is recognised even by the most recent motivation research. So your your attitude towards your involvement with the language and the culture uh, has a clear impact on your progress. <laughs> 